Welcome to Pray for Micah. And now your host, Micah Chrisman. Welcome to the Pray for Micah podcast, where we explore art, activism, spirituality, and our cosmic insignificance slash significance. Everybody, I just want to start off by saying I'm sorry. Don't be mad at me for being off for the last month or so. Um, it was mainly because spending time with family, going on some trips, so kind of took a month off. And I feel like I deserved that after 10 episodes. It was... Uh, it was well earned. It was like, yeah, maybe I should do that every 10 episodes. Just take a month off. It's not a bad idea. Reflect. But I also got some new camera gear. So um, I'm here with Ben Carpenter, my dear friend. Hello, everyone. He's my guinea pig for the new podcast recording equipment. All so right. well, I'm excited. We are going places. We got new gear that was not sponsored by Logitech. But <laughs> if Logitech hears this... They can uh, reimburse me for these cameras, <laughs> these <laughs> webcams. That uh, plug, yeah, a plug, yeah, fake plug. Yeah, Logitech does not sponsor this podcast. In case of copyright infringement, oh, what have yeah, you? Right, right, right. <laughs> ben, how the hell are you, man? Doing well, doing well. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a, been a bit. Like you said, you've been pretty, been a busy guy. Yeah. Um, no, just kind of. It's been really busy on my end as well. Uh, I got a new dog. Oh yeah. Let's hear about Loki. Loki is a 48-pound Rottweiler Husky mix, two different colored eyes, and just the sweetest little pooch uh, you could kind of gamble on. Um, no, he's, he's been doing really well. We've had him for about three weeks now, settling in really nicely. The cats aren't super sure about him yet. Well, you have Francis, our, our orange tabby, who's kind of like, you know, snuggling up to him. But he's doing great, doing great. Good, oh, man. good patio dog for sure. Yeah, and you got he's got two different colored eyes. Yeah, yeah, right. one on uh, one on the earthly plane and one on some other plane. Is uh, <laughs> that's I love that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one, well, he is a god. I mean, he is, right. He is a Norse yeah. god. So yeah, and it's yeah, it's like not a blue eye either. It's like a white eye. It's like like a White Walker from Game of Thrones. <laughs> and it's I was uh, yeah, we took him for a walk yesterday, and there was a group of uh, little eight, eight year old girls playing in a little kiddie pool and. You know, he's a pretty cute looking dog. So they come running over and they um, almost immediately notice the eyes. And then one of them just like locked on and she just was like, his eyes are so creepy. And she was like deeply <laughs> disturbed by this. Um, and she just kept saying it. We were there for probably like three minutes, you know, chatting up the, the parents. And um, she just kept saying it over and over again. And she couldn't look away either. She was locked in. Oh my gosh. And even after we walked away, I heard her just saying, his eyes, his eyes. Oh God, his eyes! Oh God, his eyes! <laughs> it's gonna be somewhere like it becomes a game with her and her friends. Like, don't look in the mirror and say Loki three times. <laughs> his creepy eyes will pop up behind you. <laughs> we do, we do call it his wishing eye. So, oh, that's but cool. You, you make a wish on it, but it's not like you know, it's like a genie wish where you know, there's always like a catch to there's it. There's a catch to it, right? Yeah. It's a, a Faustian kind of bargain. Like, product. I want a million bucks, and you get a million, like, bucks. Like, yeah. the deer, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. No, you know what I meant, Jeannie. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> yeah, but it's to teach you a lesson, you know? That's, uh, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I um, um, was thinking about just, um, yeah, the spirit of the dog, and we were talking about how They'll be great to play with each other, him and Rayla. But Rayla's so, like, dog abusive. <laughs> not, not, not totally abusive, but she uh, likes to play rough, even sure, right. now that she's five. And so she loves dogs. Like, give a shit about a human. Sure. And, like, loves humans, too. But, like, when there's a dog, like, okay, all manners go out the window, you know? But you've assured me that Loki the god could probably handle Rayla. He, he's got a ton of energy. Um, he's a year and a half old. So, you know, I think... He also likes to play, he, can, he he plays at a variety of levels. He can play gently, and he can also go ham. I've seen him do both. So I think we can we can try it out and see how it goes, for sure. We also got a hookah going for this episode. Oh. Ben said he would only come on the show if we did the whole thing with the setup with the hookah, you know. So. Hookah, the, the paisley shirts. <laughs> uh, I want all of it. Yeah, make sure I turn that so you can... We can share it. Yeah. Spread the love. This is a cashmere. Oh. Yeah, flavor. It's really 
how they made that a flavor, I don't know. I mean, it's supposed to be like a, a fabric, you know, like a, a texture. But uh, is it a what? Like what? I'm actually not very familiar with hookah. What is the? What is like? What does basically it mean? just tobacco soaked in molasses okay. and some kind of flavor scented thing. It's not healthier. It's just the oldest mechanical way that people have been smoking for thousands of years. Yeah, it's like one of the oldest smoking apparatus things from the Middle East. That no kidding. Yeah, basically, coals sit at the top, heat up the wet tobacco underneath. The smoke filters through the water, comes out your hose, and my hose is janky with a bunch of tape on it (laughs) because there's little holes. Just looks loved, you know. Yeah, it's it's well used. It's yeah. it's well practiced. Right, right. Hookah. Yeah. Let me share it with you. And while you're smoking that, I'll go ahead and read your bio so everyone can get to know you a little bit better. What you're about. Um I keep opening up the Apple receipt uh, email on my <laughs> my phone. No, no, not Apple uh receipt. Uh Ben Carpenter is uh, Groundwork, Northeast Revitalization Group's Climate Safe Neighborhoods Outreach Coordinator. That's me. That's a mouthful, but I got through it. (laughs) Groundwork is the name of the organization based in KCK. They're the Northeast Revitalization Group. And in his role, Ben explores, communicates the relationships between the climate crisis and institutionalized racism, builds the capacity of residents to self-advocate, for equitable distribution of resources and helps to organize residents to intervene in policy and planning systems. That's the idea. Hey, welcome, Ben. I should also clarify that any views and opinions expressed here by me are my... <laughs> are not those of Groundworks. Are not those of Groundworks. Groundwork also is not a sponsor of the Pray for Micah podcast. <laughs> they are definitely not a sponsor. No one's a sponsor of this podcast. <laughs> Micah's a sponsor this of Pray is, for Micah. Right. This is ground up. Ground hey, up. but your prayers are spons- are sponsoring. They're helping out this, you know. So everyone who prays for me, pray pray for Groundwork. Pray for Ben. <laughs> pray we for need Micah. It. We need all of it. It's- oh, man. So... What got you passionate about, like, climate crisis? And we were kind of sussing out a little bit ago, just like you have to take on new leadership roles, Mm. being an advocate in the community. And so what does that look like? Yeah, are we talking, like, all the way back? My Let's start from the very beginning. The very beginning. It was a windy, (laughs) blustery February evening. (laughs) Lori Carpenter went into labor. Oh, my gosh. Um, oh, Lori. Yeah. No, you know, I think like, so my, my journey into climate issues is, um, I was going to say it's a little indirect. I mean, it feels like it's just to the right of the bullseye that I was shooting for and that it ended up being its own like kind of target. If that makes sense. It's, I actually got into conservation issues when I was, um, a teenager in Fairport, New York. Um, I come from a family of hunters and fishermen and we loved camping and all that stuff. And so being not outdoors, carpenters, not, <laughs> not right. Correct. That was way, way back. Yes. That was, yeah. They were the carpenters way back. Yes. Yeah. I've been a carpenter my whole <clears> life. <throat> um, uh, but I've always found a lot of, um, grounding in the outdoors in particular. Um, and so it was, I think my, my, that my first introduction to anything political was through conservation. I grew up pretty in a house that was a pretty apolitical, leaning conservative. Um, and the outdoors was sort of the, it was like, it was a, a safe haven. It was a sanctuary. It was, like I said, it was, it was grounding both in terms of my mental health and my spiritual health at the time um, and still today. Um, and so naturally, you know, what that ends up leading into during college was um, becoming involved with, um, environmentalism right and that's not necessarily a, a leap that everybody makes i don't want to like that's not like an, a, a usual kind of jump um there's actually a ton of folks outdoors people uh, recreationists or conservationists uh, hunters fishermen sportsmen um who want nothing to do with environmentalism um i think there's always been kind of underlying kind of these like underlying everything that i've i've kind of moved forward in life with um, is this idea that um, the world is has a great capacity for beauty, um, but there are things and systems 
that really um, take from that beauty and, and cultivate a lot of cruelty and, and destruction. And so for me, the way that that melded with my love of the outdoors is that like I need to become politically active in protection of these places. Mm. Um, from there, I think there's always been an understanding that humans are very much like integrally woven into the ecosystems, right? Um, and that, you know, as much as we shape the ecosystems, they shape us. And so for sure. me, it's always been very intuitive that um, like social issues um, and, and environmental issues uh, are one and the same, but they're not really treated one and the same uh, by like mainstream American environmentalism. Um, a lot of mainstream environmental groups have long racist histories, um, mm -hmm. like very openly anti-immigrant histories up, up until like fairly recent times. Um, but I think the climate movement is different because it's sort of, um, it was in many ways like the, the nexus of, of social issues and, and environmental issues that I, um, wanted to live in, mm. uh, in terms of my work, in terms of my thinking. Um, and so I started off wanting just to spend more time outdoors and that like was sort of the, the North star for a lot of my life. Um, but that inevitably just because of my, my moral bindings, um, kind of dragged me into to climate change as like this you know, it's the this sort of looming, this looming disaster that's going to be devastating for, for lots of people around the world. And we all, you know, we're all very familiar, I'm sure, with the, the, the doom and gloom narrative, so we don't have to go too much into it. But I think that's probably where I arrived at climate Unless change. you're a flat earther, then you have other problems you're worried about. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it's like, we can't even, ar we can't even decide what environment we live in, much right. less yeah. <laughs> try to solve the environmental issues. Yeah, you got bigger issues if that's a <laughs> flat earther. Yeah. Actually, also, yeah, that's... I've talked to a few flat earthers about it. it's really interesting. Um, I have, so I also teach geography at Metropolitan Community College and okay. um, I've definitely had a few flat earthers. I, I teach geography, like really the globe, world yeah. geography. And but you've had some flat earther students and flat earther students. Cause you have to take my class. It's like a, it's like a requisite credit. And so um, our future environmentalists, flat earthers, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, well, they have a really interesting perspective on, you know, what I've found is that like flat earth and flat earthers like really just want community. They want something to like, you know, latch onto and, and, um, and to be taken seriously. Right. They want this insider knowledge sure. that other people either are too dumb. They think they're too dumb to, to believe. Um, and they just want their ideas kind of at least validated, taken seriously. And then like, walked back i guess this was you generally how i and and to be clear these are students right these are 18 year olds who i'm talking to sure so they're very much they're still waiting they're still waiting they're like very malleable um, right so no we don't have any firm flat earthers but people who are definitely like people watch too much youtube people watch way too much youtube <laughs> yeah don't watch youtube just kidding it's, yeah don't watch the show yeah it's it's no factual things are on the right. show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> although i can say that the earth is round there I've stated a fact today. Yeah, that there is, you go. That is truth. Guaranteed. <laughs> you won't get flagged by the moderators That's on that one. Uh, no, I mean, I always try to do somewhat due diligence. Now that I have these new cameras, I can actually stop to Google something. So now that's why I was determined. Like, I was using my phone to record oh, sure. past episodes. So now I'm like, well, this will be convenient. I don't have any, like, stage hand, somebody to help research. Like, is yeah, that true? Is that a fact? fact? You know? It's, yeah. So now I can actually research. I won't research flat earth right now with, you know, with our conversation. Yeah. I mean, we can get in. That's, that's for after the show. <laughs> I have something to blow your mind, man. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Rock my world. You know, <laughs> no, I, I hear you though. It's like QAnon, all these kind of conspiracy hubs. It's, it, it's uh, really just an outlet for these people to find a network of people that can, to like jive on something. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, I never like to treat someone like they're stupid. Right. You know, no, none of us. That's never our goal to try and like have conversations. But we're already trying to like argue about legitimate science. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like uh, you know, whatever, whatever it was like three years ago when we had the solar eclipse, right? Yeah. Were you here in Kansas City? No, we were that? in Syracuse. Okay, so uh, I had a friend from Scotland flying. I met him on a speech and debate trip when I was in college. And uh, we've stayed in touch just online. And he works for an observatory there in Scotland. And so he messaged me. He was like, hey, I'm going to make a visit to K 
Kansas City because it's going to pass over your area. Is it cool if I come watch the solar eclipse and stay with you guys? And it's like, hell yeah, man, come on down, you know? So he flew over, um, stayed with me for a couple days in my apartment. And the day of, like, I drove out to meet my sister and we end up in, like, this random park because we just, like, do. But we're looking at our GPS and we're, like, following these coordinates to get to this phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And, and we see it. We witness it. It's this whole weird, ethereal, like, pale, like, oh, so cool. you know, like, tra- like, it's hard to describe. It's not a sunset. It's not sunrise. Right. It's, it's this other. It's this sure. weird, pale, luminescent lighting around the whole world right and we're all just looking at each other just like freaking out jumping around dancing you know and all this crazy stuff and uh and yeah that was like the same time yeah trump looked up and blinded yeah. himself that's you know? actually <laughs> immediately what came to mind i'm like that's <laughs> you have to look at it right. through <laughs> solar oh, glasses man. you can't yeah. do that i like that that's the image that everyone takes away from that like when I think when you said the eclipse, I'm like, man, like where was I when that happened? And all <laughs> the only image that came to mind was Trump looking directly at the sun, and um, yeah, no, it's because that's yeah, media images that still stick out to yeah. me. But uh, all that to say, it was just like a lot of science went behind <laughs> bringing able to bring down like the you know where it's going to happen, where you oh, can yeah. view it, and like people have been studying. I mean. For eons, you know, movement of the stars. It's not new. It's That's not new. Very and yet reliable. When it comes to the science of climate change mm-hmm. or for environment issues, sure, we can't agree about our harm to the planet. And so it's just kind of one of those things where, like, I get it. Like, there's research that is backed by. You always have to follow the money and sure, who right. is you know because yeah, there's, there's, there's gonna like yeah. That's kind of like I get like. We have skepticism and stuff like that because, yeah, at one point there were cigarette companies right. <laughs> who were doing the research behind sure. cancer and stuff mm-hmm. and lungs as I smoke a hookah. But uh, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, corresponding, like, evidence to say that this is a real issue. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's like 97% of the world's scientists are on board with, like, anthropogenic climate change, climate right. change by humans. Um and I will say, like, I think, I mean, something, I think that COVID's, like, really brought to the forefront is this idea that, because I'm looking at vaccine skepticism, <clears throat> especially in, in certain marginalized communities, um, it really emphasized and underlined those histories of, like, where science actually, like, really fucked up. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. can I swear on this? Oh, uh, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Like, science and the federal government in particular, like, has, has caused, like, a lot of harm and violence. Um, and so, you know, one of my, something I studied in, in grad school was like the history of science, um, and the way that science can be accurate, but the curation of facts is, is, you know, produced in order to support a certain, um, like status quo. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if that status quo is like inherently racist or if that status quo is, um, capitalistic, like, or if it takes, if, if takes place within the context of a like a military industrial complex the science um i get it right like it's the science the curation of facts have been weaponized and will be weaponized again in, in mm-hmm. certain ways right so i i definitely you know kind of the same thing with the, the flat earthers where you're just like we're not going to talk in a serious way about how the flat earth theory is correct. We're not, we're not going to talk about it at all. I'm just going to push past that and then, mm-hmm. you know, um, present, you know, facts and, and have like a, a reasoned conversation and kind of validate your emotions around it um, while gently guiding the conversation in this other direction. Um, yeah. I mean, I think something, so w- with the workshops that I do, sorry, I got to clear my throat. <clears throat> do it. Um, I take like a pre-survey. So I guess I should probably give a little bit of, we don't have to go into the workshops right now, but it's, I think it's relevant um, I do climate safe KCK workshops, which focus on um, bringing participants into the climate conversation who have been historically just left out entirely um, of the climate conversation uh, in Kansas City area, especially. And we're talking about usually um, black and brown communities, uh, low income communities, um, folks who live in like formerly redlined neighborhoods. Um, sure. And you know, uh, they're 
we, we select for folks, uh, you know, we, we are able to provide stipends and childcare to, to remove those barriers to participation. Um, but what, you know, what ends up happening is you, because the conversation has been so focused on um, kind of this white, usually upper middle class kind of perspective and experience, um, a lot of the participants in the workshops actually have very little or any exposure to climate um, issues or environmental issues or ecology um, prior to the workshop. And so the pre-surveys that I do, um, the participants are like all over the board about whether or not it's even happening. They're, they're in the room. They're clearly interested in the subject. Right. Um, but yeah, it's <clears throat> the, um, whether or not it's happening at all, is it caused by God? Is it, you know, caused by 5g? And so it's, it's more just like this, um, kind of like, uh, like humble listening, like a, a hu- like myself knowing what I know and like kind of my expertise, um, like listening in a really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not empathetic. Um, I don't know. Listening in a, in a really understanding way that sure. a lot of this like knowledge gap is, is a knowledge gap that's, that's based in sort of systemic issues um, of, of marginalization. Um, and that's what I think. So I, I think in many ways it applies to other things we talked about. COVID, QAnon, um, whatever else. So I don't know where I was going with that. But. Well, I think, yeah, just that idea of that science has, like you said, historically, like we, you know, the liberal, we always want to, especially you're saying during the age of COVID, it's like we should just trust the science and we automatically just want to jump into this public health crisis with like everybody just trust what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And then historically, yeah, like <clears throat> testing medications on black and brown communities, right. you know, sterilizing native communities with these like surgery. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's all like crazy, yeah, shit you can go look up, uh, up, oh dear listener. But right. then we just automatically want people to, we want, we expect to like just have automatic trust right. when right. we come in with our PowerPoint and yep. we're teaching them. And so I get like the whole like, yeah, what? Is, you tell me it's not 5G yeah. oh, <laughs> that's yeah. giving us cancer right. or, you know, some kind of global conspiracy. And yeah, you in this day and age of vast amounts of information being shared, it's hard to sift out sometimes like what is the truth. Um, but I think like you're saying, like it takes time. It takes mm-hmm. like, and it's compassion. That's right. It <clears throat> takes compassionate listening. It takes time yes. and like sort of moving at the speed of trust. Right. You know? Right. Um, yeah, for sure. Sorry to didn't interrupt. No, that's I'm glad you found the word, you know, <laughs> so right, right. it never comes to me. <laughs> I just, I just have to move on. And then an hour later, like that, that was the word I was thinking. <laughs> you know, some other thought that was kind of come up in, relation to this conversation of just like my upbringing if you want to puff on that for a minute um you know growing up in the church um it was just an interesting time to look back and to think about what the stance was of the church that i grew up in or the culture i was a part of when it came to climate change um, or, you know, back then it was global warming, you know, it's just like, you know, terminologies that people, yeah, depending on where you are, it's right. different now. But, um, the one thing I do remember them teaching, like in the book of Genesis is that, um, that God essentially called Adam and Eve to be stewards of the earth mm-hmm. and a steward is somebody who like, Hey, the quote unquote, Le- you know, master of the world or the mm. owner of it is not here. And so you steward their, their, th- their, this possession, this, yep. their, their stuff, you keep their stuff safe until they come back. And that was always like the message about that's basically as far as it went, when it went to the environment, like we're here in our short time here, um, to win souls, to get them to heaven, you know? So on the one hand, it's kind of also like, well, fuck the earth. Cause it's all going to go up in a blaze of glory eventually. And we're all just trying to get to heaven anyways. Mm -hmm. But I guess while we're here, we might as well be good stewards of it and try to like, you know, have a good yard. You know, (laughs) it's like, Oh, actually the grass and everything we have in our yard is detrimental to the environment. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) No, I think there's actually, it's interesting that you bring that up. So, um, I mean like evangelicals have actually been really, they have a really, um, effective and, I think like really uh, beautiful 
narrative. And obviously it's not broadly speaking, it's, an, it's like not all evangelicals have this perspective. You'd be able to speak better on that issue. But the idea of the creation care um, and that, you know, if we're created in God's image and we should be, uh, behave as God, mm-hmm. basically, you know, God likes likes the plants and the birds and X, Y, Z. And, and so we should also behave as if, you know, if he, if he likes them, then we should take care of them. Like you said, um, and that, that is actually, I guess when I was back in undergrad, I would, I wrote a paper that was making the argument that Aldo Leopold made, who's, if you're not familiar with him, he's like the father of, uh, modern conservation. And I think he coined the word ecology. Um, but he was advocating for, um, instead of like this technical hyper scientific approach to, um, advocacy for the living world, uh, that we required a moral sort of um, approach to it and moral messaging and a moral framing for the way that we talked about it and, and, and talk to other people about it. Um, and so he comes up with, uh, what's called the land ethic. Um, and it's not, it's not really explicitly rooted in, in sort of, you know, any sort of, you know, theology or anything. Um, but he was a big fan of the idea of like helping, you know, promoting this idea of creation care and as, as like a, the moral sort of, if you have the two prongs of environmental communication, you have the you know, the, uh, the logos and the pathos. Um, he wants that. Well, I guess I don't know what it would be ethos, whatever. Sure. I'm getting over you. out of my depth with that <laughs> one, but he wants the, you know, in tandem with the scientific technical explanation and, and argument for things, he wants the, the moral argument mm-hmm. as well. Um, and the evangelicals have actually done a really good job of, of making that argument. And again, it's not all evangelicals. Uh, you could obviously speak better than that, uh, but, but yeah. 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 I, I, never found like really compelling leadership in my past church experiences that was like for the environment. Like I said, it was more of like the, the philosophical idea of it was, well, you know, we should take care of the planet. If, if, then again, this is just my experience, but if anything, there started to take a turn somewhere there in the like late nineties, you know, early two thousands where the church was starting to like kind of just, Probably before that, but again, I was only born in 89, so somewhere in that 10, 11 year old range, you know, yeah. I was starting to see like this kind of like shift towards, again, like any climate change or science around it was starting to become just leftist rhetoric. Yep. That's what yeah. it was becoming like, well, yeah, we should take care of the earth because God created it. Mm-hmm. And like you were saying, that to, to me, as a person who can stand outside the Bible now and look on it and see like, this refreshing perspective of it. Like, yeah, this was written during a time when all of the quote unquote world forming stories, Mm. narratives of that, like that area were all birthed out of conflict. They were like gods who clashed and their sword sparks made the stars. And, and the the corpse here giant. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, Something along those lines. I I couldn't name any specific like ethnicity or group, but from what I've read, like, there was more of these conflict origin stories of the universe um, with the powers that be. And here comes this like little tribe of, you know, of you know Jews who were Hebrews, I guess at that time, you know, who were um, basically kind of presenting a new narrative of the time. Like, Hey, this is a world who's actually been spoken and created. Like it was birthed out of like, wow, that's really interesting. this beauty and majesty for it. And so all that to say though, then, okay, well, screw recycling, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. we forget. And I mean, to the end of the day, like, I mean, I've heard people say even scientists, you know, people who are on the left liberal leaning side of it issues that recycling is just killing the earth slower. I've heard someone say <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it's certainly not an issue or a, a solution. Um, but it's gotta be systemic. I guess is the whole point. It's like, it's, yeah, yeah. They've done a good job of trying to make it like, you're, it's up to the personal responsibility to save the planet. And that's, and so, I mean, we're talking about the politi- politicization basically of, of conservation and of environmental issues yes. that's born out of the seventies. And it's like, it, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of it right now. Um, America, the beautiful, um, is, or beautiful America. I can't remember what it was. Anyways, it's basically this like giant, uh, plastics, um, association of, of plastic producers who in the 70s 60s and 70s realized that there's and in, in, in the midst of this burgeoning interest um, in uh, preserving ecosystems I mean you had 
Nixon was the one who formed the EPA, right? A lot mm-hmm. of our major, the uh, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, I'm, I'm gonna fact checked on me on this later, but I'm pretty sure that those were like, those were Republican things. Right. Um, and so you have the, the plastics industry and the oil industry and all these other guys um, realize that there's a real issue coming down the road where you're going to have a lot of government government regulation that's going to be really um, costly. And so there was like, I mean, it's, it's a coordinated campaign throughout the seventies and eighties. And, and like, then it just kind of becomes its own self-sustaining thing throughout the nineties and two thousands where the burden comes off of the polluters um, to clean up their acts. And it goes onto the individual, like, as you were saying. Right. And I think that's the same way <clears throat> that you have, um, like environmentalism and environmental rhetoric uh, kind of consigned to the left um, because it, you know, the, the, the material, the, 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 the material means of existence, whatever, um, the things that we need to survive and the things that, that capitalism sells to us, um, like will not, there's no way that you can, just not have sacrifice zones. You need to extract resources to produce stuff, right? Right. Um, and and because economies are politicized, um, then like you know, f- movements and, and campaigns and people and policies that are um, advocating against that extraction become politicized. Um, and I mean, like I know I'm, I feel like I'm talking up the right here a lot, but the right <laughs> has done quite a bit for. I mean. Conservation, like Missouri, has one of the best funded conservation programs in the country, um, mm. and it's because sportsmen. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, sportsmen. I mean, basically, the vast majority of funding for environmental programs in the U.S., at least through government, comes from um, taxes on like hunting and fishing and stuff like that. Right. Um, and and land conservation. Uh, so that that kind of that kind of deal. So what? So you mean taxes work? <laughs> Yeah, they work so you very mean well. Taxing taxes work, <laughs> and um, sportsmen who tend to be conservative, at least in my experience, are like all about paying those taxes because they are like it's so central. And like myself, like that's how I mean that was again, it's such a grounding thing to everything from like spirituality to uh, senses of masculinity. Um, mm. People are willing to pay those taxes, and and, and it's largely like. Like the conservatives have done a lot for for the environment for sure um and so it is unfortunate that's become like at least in the public arena this like the left the, the left right. is like you know the they care more the tree about hugging hippies the trees than babies right right, right. yeah they want to abort uh, you know, when this. in reality i'm I, you could probably <laughs> argue that like conservationists and, and conservatives have probably saved more trees than than liberals ever have so you hear that republicans who are this you probably saved a tree in your life oh i'm sure <laughs> i'm positive <laughs> tree huggers man that's no that's that's cool and that's like i think i think it's a beautiful example like what you're trying to bring up is like yeah the intention might be different behind it mm-hmm. but the outcome at least we can all share like what we're trying to aim for and like yeah. at the end of the day like no one wants to like being a Mad Max, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. burning desert, yeah. like no one wants that. But we also really like the shit out of our Amazon packages and things, yeah. you know. Again, I'm guilty of it, you know. Mm-hmm. And so yep. the commodification, like you're saying, of of resources becomes um, untenable mm-hmm. over the long run. Yeah. And so, yeah, like I still recycle, so I forgive my people. Don't, don't. Stop recycling just because I make a joke. No, about you should how. definitely recycle. And like things like glass and clean cardboard and aluminum, you can recycle indefinitely. And they're like, right. they're really great. Well, maybe not cardboard. I'm talking a lot out my ass this whole time. So <laughs> people can go fact check me on a lot of this stuff. Um, plastic's really the only one that you really are like, one, we should just stop producing plastics. Right. Um, I did see something recently. I don't know if it was Harvard or somebody's developed an enzyme that has prom it's it's apparently it eats plastic yeah there's it'll probably of- destroy the world you know <laughs> i'm sure one of the minute they test it'll become some kind of apocalyptic um yeah. you know mad scientist well there's all sorts of these like i mean there's i think they've, there's like a mushroom there's a fungus that eats um plastic there's like a bacteria that eats plastic and oil and um but I think that's all, like, again, it's more just like the... It's reactive. It's, it's reactive. It's you're trying to fix the problem after you've already created the problem versus... Right. It's like, move up basically, your tub, your bathtub's overflowing, and instead of just turning off the faucet, you're, you begin mopping the floor right, right. while it's actively overflowing. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if you're really interested in in 
keeping your floor dry, you should just turn off the faucet. Man, stop producing plastic. It's bad. Yeah. Here, here. So that's a little bit about kind of your passion, what you're doing for work and doing these community workshops and teaching in school, college. I want to go back to what you were bringing up about just the idea of, because you were saying that you, you know, kind of study this and I, I told kind of primed you and said, I kind of wanted to hear more about this paper you wrote in college about just explore this idea of like, I mean, you and I are definitely in this place where we're trying to like, um, detach our like, maybe what would have been presented as toxic masculinity with enjoying <laughs> nature mm. or just the male need to just be conquer something, uh, yeah. and, you know, be out and, and, uh, so can you tell me more about the research and the paper you did? And we don't have to talk about it a long time, but I just thought it was an interesting topic you chose. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, um, my graduate research, which was looking at, so, went to SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry up in Syracuse, New York. Um, and I have no like biophysical background. Um, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a chemist. Um, I'm, a, I'm a social scientist. And so um, I looked less at sort of the, the hard data um, and, and was doing more qualitative research. Um, and the sort of topic that I picked up I guess I should back up a little bit. So I got into this. One of the questions, I heard one somewhere that you should never go to grad school unless you have a very specific question that you want to answer and if they're going to pay for it, um, which they did both. And I, I had a question. Um, and it had come after I was organizing in Kansas City around, again, it was like 2016, you had the People's Climate March, um, where we were working with a couple local climate groups. We were working with Sierra Club and... Uh, some sort of, you know, a few of the council people. Um, and it was like a, a really stark example to me of how siloed environmentalism and, and the climate movement um, kind of kept itself from uh, social issues or concerns about, um, you know, racism or low poverty, uh, in, inequality, et cetera. Um, and so the, the big thing was that, like, I mean, the, the planning committee was all white um there were a lot of men on it mostly men um and you know there was at the time because again it was trump coming in so there's you know i think uh intersectionality was kind of having a buzzword moment where people were like we need to make this intersectionality or we need to make this intersectional um how do we get more diverse you know people here more diverse perspectives represented and um like they approached it with the the sort of standard toolbox that mainstream environmentalism has used uh, throughout the 20th century, which is basically saying, like, you know, we'll leave the door open and everyone's welcome, but we're not going to go take any extra steps or do any extra work to look at how our space is uh, inaccessible in many ways to uh, people of color, lower right. income folks. Um, and so it was just, it was wild. I mean, like, the... Like the Haskell, you know, Haskell, uh, the Haskell School over in Lawrence, it's like the, the Native American college. Okay. Um, they have a dance, you know, dance troupe team. Um, and they were invited not as like participants, but as like the entertainment um, at first, which oh. we shut right down. Wow. Um, there was like a couple of us on the board which were like, you can't do that. Like that's... Um, that is wildly offensive. And um, so anyways, tokenism, tokenism, tokenism. And also it's like not entertainment. It's like a deeply spiritual and like right. really like, um, you know, affirming art form. Um, so anyways, uh, after this whole event and there was like other examples of why it was just trash. Um, I was like, what is the deal? Why is it that environmentalism keeps itself so siloed? What's the history that's kept it so siloed? Um, and what are like sort of the underpinnings of the way that these groups are structured that keeps it, keeps them very insular. Um, and so what that kind of brought me to in grad school is looking at specifically the role that wilderness plays um, in uh, informing the environmental movement. And it's the idea that like the environmental movement as we understand it um, comes out of this sort of uh, like wilderness preservation and conservation movement of the early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, and 
it's all based on this idea that the you know there's chunks of the earth that are wild they're untrammeled by humans they've they're just pristine um but it ends up being like a really wildly colonial idea right and, and oftentimes like a white supremacist idea which is the idea that you know when europeans came to north america there were millions of people who lived here right who right. actively and for eons had, had actively managed the ecosystems here um but that it was all declared pristine and and in order to be remain pristine we needed to remove the the natives from like their ancestral lands um in order to like create wilderness wilderness had to be created right as an idea as a, as a construct mm -hmm. um there's truthfully like very 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 little space on earth that has not been altered by humans like for for millennia right um i mean the redwood forests right these are, <clears throat> these are ecosystems that are like very um deliberately cultivated uh by uh generations and generations of, of natives who you know uh who farmed it who, who selected for certain plant species and animal species so the point is that wilderness is basically this colonial construct that allows um you know lots of lots of different things so but we're going to the research part now so the facet of the wilderness and we, it's called the received wilderness idea which is that wilderness is pristine it's defined as like being without humans you go to wilderness um, it's like true nature um, mm -hmm. and it's by itself like a moral good that informs a lot of policy it informs a lot of activism uh, again through the 20th century and you get groups like the sierra club the nature conservancy um, and all these other groups um and so the, the what ha ends up happening is that you have environmental groups and campaigns throughout the 20th century that build their entire programming around you know this idea that nature is something that um has fallen from a state of like perfection and grace um and that like needs to be returned to that state of perfection and grace ideally or um you know at least pockets of it have to be which is defined again that, that grace and that perfection is defined by the absence of, of humanity um so anyways um that ends up informing a lot of the way that these groups interact with social issues um but that's changing right and and so um i looked at in my paper it was called um gendered wilderness um and it was looking at the various wilderness experiences um, um, across genders um, if wilderness was formed as a like um, a bastion for white masculinity it was a place where um, especially you know as places were industrializing um, usually it was rich men um, who were uh, felt like they're being feminized by an urban society could escape into and it's kind of this last bastion of their um, like homosocial control like it was it was mm. this last place where they could be men right without right. without the nagging wife and the children and mm. the the black people and the the italian immigrants and all these people coming in and so um Let that me just go out here and be a man in the, the woods yes <laughs> right the thoreaus the john muirs um and so um even if you know a lot of the discourse around what environmentalism is and looks like um has changed well let me take a beat here think about how i'm gonna phrase this so right so it is changing but it's changing because we are examining those histories and the way that mm. wilderness um masculinized wilderness um informs environmental programming um it still remains this huge barrier to participation right. for folks who are not, um, you know, traditionally masculine. They're not traditionally, you know, you know, white or, or high income. Brief intermission. Well, welcome back, everybody. You didn't know. To you, this has only been a split second. To us, this has been a 20-minute uh, troubleshooting time, so... Silly me, I uh, decided to test out these cameras on Ben. He knew that these were like 
first time doing it, and I decided, yeah, let's do high quality recording. Didn't realize it was going to equate to 168 gigabytes of video <laughs> space for two videos over the course of an hour. So all my stuff shut down, <laughs> and now we're recording the rest of this episode uh, totally audio. So YouTube people, sorry you get an hour of our lovely faces, this sexy man's face, but now you'll just have to see our pictures on <laughs> or the picture. The equally sexy pictures. And for those who are listening to us, you just get to hear our regular sexy voices <laughs> right? <laughs> without, the the, voicings. without the sexy images. <laughs> right. So... This is a good plug. If this is a time, you all should go like and subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can see half of the videos that I never... It's really great. It's honestly stellar. It's <laughs> probably why it overloaded. It was just... It was just like, I can hot. only take so much male beauty in one room. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, yeah. And if you're listening to this on your regular streaming um, podcast, you know, Spotify, Apple... Please leave a review and hit that bell so you get notifications when new episodes come out. And uh, I'll get my life together, but until then, please pray for me. Please pray for this equipment. Pray for this podcast. Hmm. It's uh, The learning curve is real. It's very curvy, like me. <laughs> <laughs> Curve's not bad. Not bad, you know? <laughs> well, Ben, uh, we just decided we were going to kind of move on from our environmental conversation as much as it is really kind of yeah really eye-opening and profound i want to delve more into you into this last part of our segment um so tell me how you and annie met uh, if you don't mind and let's hear more about the intentional community that you were a part of for a while yeah yeah so this is a story that we had to stop telling because it's you know but we so we met in because I think pe people generally find it boring. Is, so I'm gonna bore all of your listeners with it. So we we met. We were both um, doing a year in California with uh, AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps, which is a residential um, travel program for for young people, 18 to 24. Um, we were based out of Sacramento. I was building trails. She was planting trees um, and living in uh, a short stint in Barrow, Alaska. And we, there was like 300 of us, 300 of us on campus, and there was one bar, um, a clamper bar. It was, it was a clamper, it's like the a biker fraternity kind of thing. And we met, um, bonded over the fact that n we had just given up deodorant and <laughs> living in the woods, and, and nobody really cared. Um, and she, yeah. Basically, we, we hung out for, we actually met towards the end, or we started hanging out at the end of our, our term. Um, so we, like, really were only, like, physically together for, like, a couple weeks before um, the program ended. And I went back to New York. Um, we kept in touch. And in New York, uh, not a lot happening there as far as, you know, work. And my friends had moved away. Um, and so I was like, well, why not? move to where Annie is because she was pretty cool and so um actually it was we were like madly in love right and that Aww. was for a couple of weeks and so well no and like still are but um I, we would call like every night and I was like living at my dad's and there was like a little like kind of bodega corner store down the road from where we lived and so every night I would like go get a, like a 40 and then bring it back and just drink it in his front front yard and I remember just like kind of talking to her drunkenly on the phone one night and deciding that Rochester is not where I needed to be right then. And so I promised her I would be in Kansas City in 30 days. And like, so the next day I woke up and like, damn it. All right. So I made a commitment last night. Um, it was just like, it was a drunken commitment. I didn't need to follow through on it, <laughs> but I immediately um, applied for another AmeriCorps year with Harvesters, the food bank here, Kansas City. And I'd been working at a pool supply store for like $7 an hour and like not a lot of hours a week. So I had like $200. I spent a hundred on that hundred of that on a Greyhound bus ticket and, um, took the bus. It was like a 32 hour bus ride cause it kept breaking down and she actually had to come pick me up in Columbia, Missouri, where we have an, another friend who lives there. Um, but she had told me that it was okay to, you know, 
stay at her parents' place for a couple of weeks while I get things in order with harvesters. And um, I didn't realize that her family had just moved to Kansas City from Manhattan, Kansas. And so we're in this sort of like transitional apartment kind of thing. And so it was m- me, some like stinky dude from New York um, who they'd never met, um, staying on their couch with like her, her adult brother, and then uh, the, the parents. So I slept on the, the patio, um, you know, because like, nobody knew me. We Annie and I had only known each other for like a month and a half. So um, <laughs> eventually I was commuting on the bus here to Harvester's. Um, I was commuting from their apartment to Harvester's each day, like three hours, one direction. So I was like, that's not sustainable. And so I ended up couch surfing with a, a coworker. And um, yeah, that coworker happened to be the roommate of her, the one person that she knew in Kansas City uh, who was like her ex-boyfriend. So I lived with her ex-boyfriend for three weeks. And then I ended up getting a house with uh, another coworker. But anyway, so... That was that. We lived in Kansas City for two years and then decided to go to grad school in, in Syracuse, New York. And so what we ended up finding was we wanted we knew that we wanted to live in a, an intentional community. Annie had lived in a co-op before. She loved it. I had lived on like kind of a co-op-y organic farm before, loved it, and also knew that it was a very affordable way to live. And we didn't have a ton of money because we'd been working as AmeriCorps volunteer service members um, for a year and then like low wage nonprofit workers for another year. So we found a place called bread and roses, <clears throat> which is the sort of self-described, um, communo anarchist, like justice space. And it was very cool. Honestly. Um, like the, 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 at least the, the space was right. Um, the sort of completely or nominally non hierarchical sort of living arrangement where we shared groceries and we shared um, duties, you know, kind of the basic co-op model. Uh, There's these two beautiful, like, restored Victorian giant homes um, kind of back to back. And so the the entire, like, space between them was taken up by, like, this beautiful forest and, like, huge garden where we got a ton of food from. And it was really cool. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, bread and roses. And and a lot of good people live there. There's probably 14 people who live there at any given time. Um, and something that, that stood out to us, you know, compared to our past experiences with kind of cooperative living arrangements was that this wasn't like for college kids necessarily. It was, it was like a, it was a cooperative made up of like adults, like professionals. Like we had a lawyer who lived there. We had like a software engineer. We had a a professor at Syracuse university. Um, and like people had children were raising kids here. Um, it was, it was like a very responsible, <laughs> very like <laughs> put together place for sure. It was, it was pretty, pretty interesting. We didn't end up leaving. You know, but that's yeah. where I'll end that and tantalize for the other questions that come in. <laughs> that's funny what you're describing, you know, 14 people, two Victorian houses. Like, so basically the future of investment for millennials when it comes to property is just like, yeah. even if they don't call it a co-op or an intentional community, it's just, okay, the way the housing just market is. Sense. Yeah. Everyone's just like, literally, I just had a friend the other day, like proposed to me. He was like, um, what do you think about going out of a house with me and my, uh, my, my wife, my partner, and we can, uh, <laughs> find somewhere that has a, you know, basically a whole floor to itself you right. know, or something. And, we can you and your brother can move in. I was like, oh, sounds about right. Like, I mean, yeah, they call it like co-housing or something <clears> like that, which is like you just have roommates, right? Yeah, and uh, I think Shawnee actually just um, like banned that. Really, like you can't like you can't have like more than three unrelated adults living together in Shawnee, Kansas. Wow, yeah, sounds like something they would do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably that whole county, they're like, well, we already tried to get rid of mixed income housing. Right. And so let's really try to stop this by stifling. Yeah, it just seems co-owning. like it's such a weird, weird hill to die on. But I mean, I guess I guess you have a bunch of these. You don't want too many millennials moving in, I guess. Yeah. Just killing your Applebee's, killing your. They're so mad at us that we don't buy more shit, buy houses and stuff. And then they make laws like that. That was so stupid. Right. They're That's just. Like, Okay, you can't afford a house on your own. All these uh, boomers are buying up the houses and have more leverage, capital to leverage, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, 
Yeah. No, I, I think tying into the conversation we had before, like co-housing is in like cooperative housing. I do believe like really represent like viable and Casey tenants, I think is working on something like this, but it, it represents a really viable answer to like a lot of, um, a lot of social ills, you know, isolation, inequality, um, but, but also like a lot of environmental like ills, like mm -hmm. it's, it's really like a really sustainable way to live, concentrating resource uses. Like, right. It, it's cities are already pretty sustainable considering, you know, obviously there's lots of problems, but, um, sort of concentration of resource use, um, is really, really efficient. And then like the co-op is just that on a smaller scale. And so I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of it. Um, as a, as an idea and a, and a model, I haven't seen like, Hmm, I guess I've not seen one that also didn't come with like lots of other like complicated frills. Yeah. Drama. Drama. Baggage. Right. <laughs> so if you can figure that out. Yeah. Figure out how to get rid of human drama. Yeah. <laughs> Where the humans live. Truly. No, no, just... Truly. Well, and I've shared with you, but for folks who are listening, maybe don't know, I lived part of yeah intentional community here in kansas city local community farm i really like, completely forget that every time you forget your life. it's like it was a really defining characteristic about you for the longest time and then you moved out and now i'm just like oh sh shoot oh yeah. yeah i could i could live there for like a long time yeah for a couple of years um yeah chairs brook catholic worker good folks doing some really good work here in the northeast i don't live far from them i'm just like a few minutes down the road um it was, uh, yeah, really formative time. It was tough because it was during the pandemic. Mm. And so I don't feel like I got to really experience the community. Um, I just experienced it different than, like, I think how I was planning to experience it, which was like, hey, we're serving, you know, we're doing showers for folks in the community. Like, we offered showers so people can get fresh clothes and just freshen up for their day and provide a breakfast. But then there's also chickens and bees and whole orchard. And so it's one of those things where <clears throat> it was, um, yeah, just uh, really good folks. But like all of our volunteers disappeared because half of our yeah. volunteers were like folks over the age of 55, 60s. Right. Most of them were retired. And so they were an at-risk demographic for COVID and – it just put a lot of hurdles and barriers to our service to the community, but we still stayed open. We still, I mean, not during the shutdown, of course, at that point we shut, you know, shut down for like two weeks or a month. I can't remember how right. long. Um, but I remember like one of the days we were open and it's like right after the shutdown some months afterwards, pretty fresh to the pandemic. And, I mean, it was like something out of the Great Depression, man. There was like over 100 people like in a line outside of our door because we could only let in like 10, 15 at a time. But then there was like all these new faces, families with kids mm. coming to just get some food and supplies because, yeah, again, the stores and everything was ransacked. Um, right. And so, yeah, it was just a really hard time and then I just struggled a lot with my mental health and started counseling during that time and so and my family started they um, were selling the farm and so right yeah yeah I decided to move out of the community move back in with my folks to help them kind of wrap up and sell the farm for like six months um, and then just kind of move back into the neighborhood but didn't move back in the community because yeah just Honestly, wanted to have my space back. Yeah. <laughs> I just had been living so totally. much with, you know, the community, living with my parents. It was like, I just kind of need some space to kind of work on myself. Mm -hmm. So I started renting this place that I'm staying at. Um, it was a tough time, but it was really, um, yeah, it was just, I'll never forget this kind of era. You know, I mean, yeah. obviously with the pandemic, but just a lot of loss, a lot of like, love and goodbyes to the farm um but yeah therapists help me a lot yeah, <laughs> processing yeah. and just uh accepting change right yeah. we just we have to accept change and loss and and uh love love what's happening sorry my pets are out there <laughs> destroying something <laughs> oh is that what that is I those, I that, that, that was the 
the skeleton. Well, I closet. keep seeing my cat's paws like reach under the, the door. He's oh. trying to get your water bottle. <laughs> he's like, he's like you can't have it, Pumba. I paid thirteen dollars for this water bottle. <laughs> um, yeah, no COVID. COVID, I think. Man, when you talk about it, like really derailing. I mean, obviously a lot. It's, it's a awful thing. I think we just like officially cross the million death threshold. Um, and it, it really makes you feel like you're not allowed to, to like, grieve the ways, like the small ways, the, not the small ways, that certainly the, the, the less traumatic ways in which it altered our lives. Yeah. But like that's, I hadn't thought about it. Like it really did like, I mean, I was gonna use the word ruin, but like it really just, it altered the way that you experienced living in community. Right. Um, yeah, because it was like kind of a community in isolation, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like the handful of us that lived there would still have dinner and do stuff together. But anytime we had a COVID scare, it's like they would have to lock, you know, right. quarantine for a couple weeks. And and a community in isolation like kind of undermines the whole idea of like of community. A community. We're all supposed <laughs> to be sharing called? each other's forks and spoon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just pass around germs. Like. Yeah. Well, I was thinking even like the idea because I, I think like co-ops represent like this idea that humans need to be together right like we're in we're reliant on each other and that yeah like we as bread and roses live together in a house and we have like our own like weird little things but we're also like part of that like frame of thinking i think includes like being very interwoven with like everything outside the doors right the all the community outside the doors whether it's the you know the, the houseless neighbors you were talking about or mm-hmm. um, I mean anybody uh, just just generally folks out in the neighborhood um, and so I could see where it would be like a special kind of like isolation and insularity which I think co-ops also kind of lend themselves to mm-hmm. I could see where that would be become a problem in COVID yeah well, Ben, do, do, are we starting our own intentional community? Is that what's happening now? I think I think that we should. <laughs> you, Annie, me. <laughs> this is our As friends. it happens, I have a business proposition. Right? Oh, Which, it just so happens. Oh. <laughs> how would you like to sell goat soap and hammocks? Oh, okay. <laughs> from a 10-acre plot and outside Chillicothe. <laughs> oh, Chillicothe. Yeah, interesting place. Uh, only if the goats are consenting to the the, mm. the whole Can process. Can animal ever consent? We were, talking, we were <laughs> debating whether or not we were going to talk about That's true. vegetarians. <laughs> Can an animal consent to giving you soap from their from their nether regions? <laughs> nether regions. I think the answer is a firm no. But I don't know. Maybe there's maybe there's an ethicist out there that will dispute me on that. Until we uh, plant chips in our head. And plant the chips in animals' brains, and we can telepathically communicate. I guess or communicate. We won't know fully, but oh, we I actually want to circle back. So, you, the initial question had been, "Tell me about Annie. Tell me about your experience in the co-op." Yeah. And one of our biggest challenges is that, like, was, I mean, that that co-op experience was actually like really hard on our relationship. And I realized that, like, I probably would never go back to living in community if I was in, like, a committed relationship. And, um, yeah, like, I think it's just because there's so much emotional... You're, you, that's definitely, like, a different relationship than you would have with a normal roommate, right? Like, it's you, right. you're, like, very much tied up in the, the other person's, like, well-being, your roommate's well-being, your housemates, um, which meant that it felt like you had, like, 12... You had like a partner and then you had 12 other like people who came very proximate to being a partner. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was like really, really hard. And yeah, I mean, because you you feel like you owe it it, unless unless you have like really good boundary management, which I don't have. (laughs) um, Yeah, that's I think that really affected us. And so we actually ended up moving out after a year and then just getting our own place because we just needed to be a couple. Yeah, just focus on each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I could see totally how that would affect or, you know, especially a new kind of, you know, blossoming a relationship. Like, like I said, it's, it's taxing. Like, and like, I didn't, like I said, I, my community, they were, I had my own space, so they were living across the way, but 
just the constant, you know, folks need stuff, you know, and they're right. knocking on your door and people in the community and they want to talk or, mm-hmm. and so just the emotional and mental, like it taps you out after a while. Oh, yeah. So it's hard to like, how can I offer something to my partner now? Again, I didn't have one. <laughs> it was me and Rayla, I guess. I My dog, oh, yeah. I guess. I came back. Rayla, Rayla, I just don't have the emotional capacity for Rayla you. feels very discounted right now. <laughs> As if she wasn't suffering the entire time. Yeah. No, she was just like, are we going to go out and eat these chickens yet? <laughs> like, can I just chase <laughs> these chickens? You've been out, you've been downstairs serving breakfast for too long. It's time to go chase some chickens. Um, but yeah, I could see how, yeah, it would be tough, especially with 14 people. That's a whole mm. other ball game, like two houses, 14 people. Like, yeah. how do you manage your time and energy and, and be able to invest in the person you love? Yeah. It was hard. We did not do it well. <laughs> that's that's all there is to say about that. <laughs> that's all there is just we did not do community well. <laughs> no i mean we, we, we made some like really good friends with whom we're like still very close to and then and then uh but, but you know if i never see that place again it'd be too soon so well hey if your community didn't turn into a uh, charles manson <laughs> or whatever if you didn't turn into hey we murdered a bunch of people then i think you did community success fine. yeah it's yeah, a success fair enough fair enough no one died no one <laughs> could trapped. always be worse with, yeah. you know and I, I love how yeah i tell people i live in this potential community and you start to describe it and it's they're like so are you living are you okay micah blink twice like are you can you leave at your own free will it's yeah. like yeah no this is not a cult this is uh <laughs> yeah well that's yeah i mean we definitely we joked about it, like for halloween having getting like cloaks and things like that just to, <laughs> and it didn't help that like we like it was supposed to be like a very like justice and activism oriented co-op but it, they had been like in the globalization anti-globalization movements of like the late 90s and things like that and so a lot of folks had just been out of like like r- like real movement circles for a while just focusing on careers and, and doing whatever and so the consequence was that we it was really isolated. It was like a, it was a pretty insular co-op, um, both ideologically and then like just like literally just no one had a lot of friends, <laughs> and so um, it definitely felt like, felt pretty culty from time to time. But but that's you know. But you anymore. left and you were allowed to leave. So that, and uh, Annie like had to drag. Me. I was like I was I drank the Kool Aid. I was like ready to go. I was like all in. She had to like deprogram me, saying like you know, <laughs> Father Steve is like not you know, God, and he's not, he's not actually here to, to lead us to salvation, um, oh. which was something that I, you know, not really. <laughs> you were like, oh, uh, I was like, oh, I didn't realize you know, <laughs> your father, Steve. So, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's a, he's a fine person. That's good. That means you have a good partner on hand, someone who can help be that outside eyes and, and perspective, you know, yeah. kind of. I'm also a waffler, so I think that really helps. Also, if Annie's the bulldog, I'm I'm the waffler. And what does that mean, the waffler? It means that I assume that I'm often wrong, and so defer to the wisdom of others, um, which is also like makes me very susceptible to becoming like a cult member, <laughs> and and like living happily as a cult member, but also like keeps me safe in that like Annie as the like much wiser person in our relationship, you know. Yeah. She, you know, if she tells me to to jump. I, I say, how high and X Y Z, and <laughs> and then like uh, she, if she says we need to leave this cult, I'm like, oh yeah, you're probably right. We do need to leave this cult. So yeah, you know, come to think of it, you did seem pretty eager to jump on the bandwagon to start a pray for Micah church. Oh know? yeah. <laughs> oh. I just I was joking. I was like, "Well, this is basically church for me. I could probably get a grant for from a for a church thing." And you're like, "Yeah, well, let's let's like make these like let's meals, make an and we could like start a <laughs> pray for Micah church weekly potlucks where we <laughs> go around and, and share affirmations and yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm in. I'm I'm all in. Yeah. And then you could have the we talked about like the sort of deluxe. What was it the the Church of Micah deluxe where it was like <laughs> the private ayahuasca tours. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the only specific, you know, it, we, we don't, that's the the behind the curtain. Right. Pray for my church. No, that's, right, yeah. The, that's when you graduate <laughs> to, like, the next, like, level two. Level two, two yes. Level two, right. Yeah, it is a pyramid. Yeah. I yeah, mean, right. And right. come out of your ayahuasca trip, and there's me. So there's, there's. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not egotistical enough, uh, but, you know. 
I guess anyone's got to be a little narcissistic to start a podcast is what I'm told. Mm. So I just accept that as like <laughs> a, a humble state, yeah, humble you're the, you're reality, the but least narcissistic narcissist. I, I know if, if that's the case. Yeah. That's... Well, I appreciate that. I, uh, yeah, I, I I'm like you, I kind of, at this point of kind of, yeah, distance myself from wanting to be the leader of a thing, mm. you know, right. like, I had enough white saverism, leadership, <laughs> church stuff going up yeah. to, to, to realize my humble place in the universe. Like I've had enough <laughs> mind, you know, breaking uh, experiences to yes, realize, my... yeah, I'm not really the shit, you know. Right, <laughs> like, right, yeah. But we're pretty cool people, I like and to think so. I, like to think I think so. we'd start a pretty reasonable cult. If I think we, it'd be cool as hell. <laughs> I think it'd be great because, like, you know, it would. Yeah, no, I think. There would be all the good parts. It would just be, you know, community meals. It'd be community living, you know, yeah, lots of lots of things that are probably like, I don't know what how what your podcast is rated as far as like for what audiences, but there's lots of things I mean, the the cults are good at. They're yeah, good at, you know, group sex, like things that would be fun. Yeah, we're I'm great at that. Yeah, no, just, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, say says. You know, satirically. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, tell me about this year. Like, what are you hoping to do? What are your kind of aspirations? I know you and Annie are getting a house, um, looking at a place. Yeah, we're looking to rent um, a house. Um, yeah, we're moving in August to a house uh, in, you know, I guess I, it's not quite South KC, but it's, you know, it's just south of Rockhurst. Um, and so it's gonna be much better for the dog and the cats. It's got a yard. Um, I don't know, man, like COVID, I feel like COVID's just put me in this mood mode where I'm like, I don't have like year long aspirations anymore. I'm just like, can I make it through summer? Can I make it through summer? <laughs> um, how do I like, how do I s- start things back up again? Like I would like to start writing more again. Um, we were talking earlier about like how, like, I feel very much uh, like a a North star in my life has always been not to be a leader, but to like, to be a witness to things um, and to be a writer and and, and witness things in that way and like record them. Um, And I've gotten way away from that. Um, Just buried myself in work in really unhealthy ways. And yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to get a healthier relationship with my job and, and kind of work more on the creative Creative things that give me life and spend more time in the woods. Um, that also kind of dropped off for whatever reason. Yeah, well, I'll go out with you to yeah. the woods this summer. Yeah. We're going to Oklahoma uh, a few weekends from now. Really? Yeah. Uh, Wichita Mountains National Wildlife Refuge. I've never heard of that. It's super cool. They have buffalo and antelope and elk. Oh, that's cool. So, And uh, we had a friend going with us, but she ditched. So there's an extra spot. Well, look at that. Me and Loki riding back seat. Oh, yeah. You and Annie in the front. Yep. Old Lokester. <laughs> I guess Rayla would have to come too. So then uh, there's two dogs and me in the back seat. No, I'm just kidding. We could have, I mean, we can do that. We can make that work. <laughs> we could find, we could find and make that work. Find a way to make that happen. It'll be a fun, it'll be a fun summer. I know that, yeah, like you said, COVID's been hard and we've, and I, I appreciate like Ben started these like. Yeah, basically Saturday night dinners with our friends, and it's been really just um, really personal, like, uplift for me, and I think for everybody who's gone. Like, for a while, we were just doing it outside to Mm. stay distant, and now just kind of with protocols and people knowing they had COVID came back, and, and... we're now better. <laughs> yeah. You know, everyone could just feel safe around each other. Oh, okay. So you had COVID like two weeks, you know, yeah, now, yeah. you know, and, uh, yeah, I just think it's a beautiful way to do com- community. Anytime you can do food with each other with good peeps, you Dude, know? Right. That's yeah. That, that is something like from before COVID that like a, def- a desperately miss is, is that sort of, yeah. Sharing food, sharing spaces, um, all the things that like give life meaning, uh, and I think the, I think the Saturday night supper club is, is really a good first step in remedying that, um, and, and kind of reclaiming that, but yeah, get out of our social, social isolation. A yeah. Bit. Yeah. And retrain us how to talk to 
I don't know, our, even our friends, um, which I feel like I've suffered with, for sure. <laughs> we have to learn how to people again. We need to learn how to people again. <laughs> something, yeah, something, it's apparently way harder than I remember it being, so. Sure. Well, Ben, um, where can we find you online? Well, you can't. I've been you can't. Sp- oh. I, don't, I don't exist. I'm a figment of your imagination. Are you like Ron Swanson? You're like <laughs> Parks and Rec, just like, but I'm off the grid. Like, you can't find me anywhere. No, I mean, like, you can, I, I have, like, Instagram. It's like Foster Carpenter. Foster Carpenter 346 is my handle. If you have any interest in following our travels, Annie and I have a blog called Cheap Trip on Medium, which you can link in the, you know, find the link in the bio of my Instagram. Um, and I post there on all sorts of things like, um, you know, I do reviews of gas stations. Nice. Um, we do, Annie has an ode to the road burrito review kind of series where she reviews road burritos. And then, um, and then we also talk a little bit more about the, the work that I do with groundwork, um, around specifically like looking at those connections between historic disinvestment through policies like redlining and then present day climate vulnerability. Um, and yeah, so that's it. And then like, I mean, if you're interested in, so Groundworks website is just groundworkusa.org. Um, that's the national networks, um, website. Ours is, uh, our trusts, uh, website is northeastkck.org. Um, but yeah, so that's me. I don't do Twitter. (laughs) I heard it's an awful place. Yep, it's probably going to get more awful after Elon Musk takes over. <laughs> it seems unfathomable <laughs> to me, but like, there, I'm so not surprised by awful things anymore that, <laughs> like, okay, all right, one more. Let's tack it on there. Yeah, yeah, social media. <laughs> not good. Hey, everybody, you know where you can you can do? Follow Pray for Micropod on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all those places. And uh, be sure to leave a review if you can. Like I said, can't say enough. Thank you all to my our patrons, people who are out there supporting the show by just sharing the content, just sharing the stories and the people, impeccable people like Ben who come on and uh, share their life with us. So until next time. Until Thanks next for time. joining me for the Pray for Micah podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe on this channel and follow me on social media. Pray for Micah Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and yes, even TikTok. We'll see you next time. You are now re-entering the normal world.